Good morning, Westbridge Church. Good morning. Look out your window right now. You can't see your neighbor's house. <laughs> it is snowing sideways. Giant flakes. It is, yes. Yeah. yeah. I have a feeling a lot of you are probably watching from home this morning instead of coming here, it, which is both sad but understandable. We, you are the smartest people in the room. <laughs> uh, my Kia Optima needed tires last August. Uh-huh. I have not put them on yet. So any slight hill is a challenge and exciting. But so I made it. Even on the way in early this morning, it was already really slick. And yeah. I stopped by so. Dunn Brothers, grabbed a coffee. There was just a car up on the snowbank. I the saw sidewalk. that. I saw that driving in, too. They yeah. just lost the road or yeah. something. And I, just like, let's go up here, get a better looked, view. That looked like negligence more than. Wow. More than. I'm just, just, I'm just saying. Here at Westridge, we judge <laughs> whatever we see. I'm always we judging judge. your driving, even right now. Oh uh, well, good morning. Hey, we're gonna drop the question in right away uh, this morning. We want to talk about what's the name of a movie you love to watch as a kid. Somebody jumped in on the live lobby and said, "Sound of Music." Sound of Music. I see Mary Poppins as well. Ooh, yeah, Mary Poppins. So what? What is it for you, man? You seem, you seem like a Mary Poppins guy. Wow, shots fired. <laughs> Oh, I can't wait for you to answer this question. This is the morning we're going to have, Josh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, I you know, I really liked um Princess Bride as a kid. Okay. That had yeah. had sword fighting, it had pirates, it had giants, had swamp animals. What age so what age were you really into this movie at? Oh, man, I was It was like my older sisters more influenced, like gotcha. that's what they wanted. Gotcha. And I was like, "Well, cool. There's like uh, yeah. Captain Pirate Man." I'm just well, we, you were saying pre Pre lobby, you were saying that you were you raised in a pretty conservative home. That movie, I think, is rated PG. So that's oh, uh, man. I have you know? a lot of stories. I don't know if we can get into <laughs> it right now, but we'll. Yeah, no, I can't. I can't. Yeah. Tell me your answer, yeah. Josh. Well, so for me, it was probably Aladdin. Aladdin, primarily, yeah. Aladdin. Okay. Um, I also had four VHS episodes of Ninja Turtles that I borrowed from my best friend across the street. They were from Burger King. You used to be able, like in kids' meals for a while, you could get these four episodes of Ninja Turtles. Like a VCR tape yeah. in a kids' meal? Yeah. Man, we have yeah. changed that. Every, we yeah. have lowered that bar exactly. significantly. Yeah. So I, I pretty much wore out my friend's Ninja Turtles tapes watching those four episodes over and over again. Fun fact, so. I was not allowed to watch Ninja Turtles. Uh, I think it had something but to do with But you were allowed the, to watch Princess Bride. Yes. That, that had no, no, it did have mutants. They had real humans trying to kill each other. <laughs> Very true. I think it was something in the theme song, and I'm trying to remember. <sighs> Heroes in a half shell? Nope. That, Turtle that, power. That, that was not the offensive part. They're the world's most fiercest <laughs> fighting team. Please go through it all. <laughs> I think it was something like, oh, it was some kind of like supernatural well, that, like, yeah, I mean, part of mutated, it. Yeah, I mean, they mutated, you know. They <sighs> mutated. Yeah. I, you know, I missed out on the team. <laughs> but who is your f favorite Ninja Turtle? Mine was always Leonardo uh, because he was the leader, and I thought that was cool. He also had the best weapons, katana blades. You Correct. Know? So, Man, I'm yeah. going to agree with you. Michelangelo is the funniest. He's but, the funniest, yeah. but that kind of gets a little old. That's yeah. like Paw Patrol. I think we're all in probably a Paw Patrol season. <laughs> like, Marshall just annoys me now. He yeah. just falls and trips yeah. all the time. It's like, it's come like, on. Get a new shtick, man. Yeah. You know? Get coordinated. <laughs> we would love for that to happen. Man, people are starting to show up. Good morning, Carmen Prine. Uh, she's down in Texas. It's probably a little nicer now. I think the snow has melted down there I would, and I came would up say, here yeah. now. Yeah. But it is... Uh, I would rather be in Texas this morning, I think. I think I probably would, too. I think there's a lot of people who yesterday thought spring is here and then woke up today and said, it's like Groundhog's yeah. Day. I mean, again, looking around the lobby, it looks like a lot of people felt the same looking out their window this Man, morning. So. Thank you for engaging with us at home <laughs> today. Uh, spring is coming, but we got to remember we're in Minnesota. So we're going to have fake spring. We're going to probably have about four fake springs. We're, yeah. First, first fake spring, second fake spring, Man. And third then, fake spring, and then all of a sudden it's like summer and right. fall, and twenty one. I just hope we have a gone. spring, a real spring at all, because that's one of my favorite seasons. I like spring. Do you have a? Do you have any animals? I do not. I do not. I feel like I didn't like spring when we had a dog because yeah, it was mud. like muddy paws everywhere. everywhere. But yeah. I can deal with that. Yeah, can I deal with that? Well, uh, man, thank you guys again for being with us this morning. There are people in the auditorium. There are. Yes, there are. There are, I can't say dozens and dozens. There are <laughs> singles and singles. There of are people. dozen. There are dozen people here there in the auditorium. There are dozen <laughs> peoples here. 
this morning in person, risking life and limb to get here. But thanks again for joining us online. Remember uh, to get the Church Center app if you need the notes for today's talk, if you want to see what's coming up, uh, events page, all that stuff, Church Center app, or you go to our website. But please like, love, share, hug, care, all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, we're so glad you're with us. Absolutely. Man, what are we singing today? We are singing, uh, we got uh, My Testimony, The Goodness of God, and we're going to rattle. Rattle. We're going to rattle. Oh, it's going to be rocking. Yeah, we are. We are going to rattle here. and rock. Yeah, you bet. Man, well, thanks again, Josh. It seems like band is starting to come. Yeah, I better get back to the drum set. So I'll see you from the drum set. Good morning. Drive safe if you're coming in for second service or anything, and uh, enjoy the service. Man, you dropped the peace sign. I didn't know people still did that. I learned something today. We still do the peace sign. That's great. But, yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, you are such a big part of the Westbridge family, and we're so glad you're with us each and every week. We see you guys, and you make our job so much more fun when you talk to us. So uh, thanks again. I'm trying to remember if there's anything else. Uh, we got First Step coming next Sunday. So if you'd like to show up. Whoa. Jacob, thanks. Good morning, Westbridge. Man, you should come here. You just, snow that's the drive. rock? You should drive in this weather. Drive carefully. We'll see you second service. Jake has a Toyota Tundra, so he is safe. My Kia Optima, it was a little sketchy today, but uh, we made it. But um, if you'd like to come to our first step class, you can register for that online or on the Church Center app. We just need to get a good head count for kids, uh, child care, and for food. So. If you'd like to learn more about Westbridge, why we started, why we do the things we do, we'd love to see you there. We are going to come up with an online version for you guys as well, so stay tuned for that. Uh, thanks again for being here. You guys enjoy the rest of the service. And sometimes the delay happens, but I think we made it. Well, good morning, Westbridge. It's great to have you guys with us. Great to see we made it out in the weather. If you're joining us online, we want to say a special welcome to you guys as well. Let's stand and we're going to just jump into a time of singing and worship this morning. This first song is a song of victory. That it's our testimony of what he's done for us. So let's sing it together. I saw. And I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. And I believe in signs and wonders. And I have resurrection.
Of the goodness of God. 
sing. singing to a God who brings dead things to life. And this morning, this song is about the miracle that He is and what He can do and what He has done in our lives. So let me encourage you to sing these words as they show up on the screen. And let's just worship God. Let's lean in this morning. Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. You're not going Stop you I sing Friday's disappointment Sunday's empty too Since when? Since when is impossible Ever stops you This is the sound of dry bones rattling This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. So open the day and I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Yeah! a of fire, stirring something new. together. My God is able to say. My God is able to say and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just ask a man who was thrown on the bones of Elisha.
card and you can also sign up on our church center app so thank you guys so much for singing with us today and you can go ahead and take a seat well i'm so glad you all made it through the snow way to go good old minnesota i'm so glad to be here today and i just want to welcome you to westbridge i want to say hello to those of you viewing us online hope you're enjoying your warm coffee and your pajamas there and say hello to those of you in our parent viewing area which is a great option if you have small kids that you would like to keep with you and if you are a guest with us today, I want to say a special welcome to you. We are just thrilled that you are here joining us today. And on your way in, if you grabbed a program, I'd like to go over that. First thing, there's an outline for you to follow along with today's talk. And next is a connection card. If you're a regular attender, you can fill out your name and email address. And if you are a guest with us today and you fill this card out and bring it to the desk in the lobby, we have a gift for you. Just our way of saying thanks for joining us today. And really quick, I just want to talk about first step because that is coming up on March 7th. And if you want to find out more about the church, I'm going to ask you to register for this class. You can write that on your connection card, net first step, or you can also sign up on the Church Center app. 
And last thing in there is an envelope. So if you would like to give today, you can use this and drop it in the giving stations at the back of the auditorium after service because everything we do here is because of your continuous generosity. So thank you for that. So with that being said, enjoy the rest of the service. Welcome everyone to Westbridge. If you are online or in person with us, thank you so much for joining us. My name is John and I'm a part of our creative team. Now I wanna bring your attention to a few things that are happening right here at Westbridge. Wanna know more about Westbridge Church? Join us for our Westbridge First Step. Discover why we started the church and why we do things the way we do them. You'll learn about the vision and values here at Westbridge Church. The next one is March 7th at noon in the middle school room. Lunch will be provided and childcare is provided. So sign up at the Church Center app or at westbridgechurch.com slash events. Parents of fourth and fifth graders, today is the day. Bring your family and your sleds to Highwoods Park in St. Michael this afternoon, Sunday, February 28th, from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. They will have a chance to meet up with friends that they see on Sundays, and you can invite other friends and families to join in on the winter fun. Families will have a chance to meet some of their fourth and fifth grade leaders and other Westbridge families. Head to westbridgechurch.com events for more information. Now, as we move to the next part of our service, we want you to know that Westbridge is intentional about creating welcoming environments online and in person for everyone. So no matter what your relationship with God is or isn't, we are so glad you're here. Enjoy the service. Good morning. Welcome to Westbridge Church. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here. Awesome to have you with us. I want to say hello to everybody joining us online. And uh, we're continuing a series called Nobody Told Me. But first, I got to give a shout out to whoever planned a fourth and fifth grade sledding day for today. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I mean, I don't know how you knew that fresh powder was coming, but uh, man, hats off to you. That's amazing. So if you got a fourth and fifth grader, you could not have picked a better day for a, a sledding afternoon. Uh, think about the last time that you were on a roller coaster. Uh, I know that for us, it was probably about a year ago, we were uh, just before everything broke loose in 2020, uh, we were in Florida and our family was on a family vacation and we had the opportunity to go to SeaWorld. And at SeaWorld, they've added some roller coasters and one of the roller coasters at SeaWorld is a roller coaster called the Manta. And the Manta is, uh, it's an interesting roller coaster because you actually, <clears throat> you actually lay down and, and it kind of grabs your feet and it puts you parallel to the track. And the track is above you and you're just kind of like supermanning it. And the track is above you. So when you go down a hill, you can imagine there's nothing in front of you, nothing underneath you, and you're heading straight to the ground head first. It's pretty awesome. And uh, what's awesome about it is even when you're on the ground, because of the way that hill comes down and it comes down straight towards the pavement, and as spectators, you can stand there and just watch people's faces as they head right towards you. It's pretty sweet. And so you can really observe like who is like, some people are just terrified and freaking out and just screaming. Other people are just like, oh, just waving their hands in the air like they just don't care. And... Uh, so it's just fun to watch the reactions. And I love how roller coasters now for the last probably, what, 20 years, 25 years have, have captured what they deem to be the biggest thrill on that particular ride. And they put a camera there and they capture your face and in the hopes that you'll want to buy a picture, right? And, and I just think it's great uh, to, to look at the differences in some of those pictures. Because when you get off that roller coaster and you look at those pictures, it's amazing how two different people are experiencing the exact same ride so differently. I want to give you a few examples. Uh, here's this first one. She's having a lot of fun. <laughs> and he looks like he's going to die, right? Like, he is like, why did you bring me on this ride? Here's, here's another one. Uh, I love this. Notice the people in the back, hands in the air, like they just don't care, right? And uh, she is like... I'm going, I'm going to meet my maker right now. This is what's going to happen. Here's another one. And uh, I love this. Different, different reactions. Let's zoom in a little bit. Maybe you can't, maybe you didn't catch it, but <laughs> she is absolutely thrilled to be there. 
And man, I can tell you, a lot like these roller coasters, life is filled with ups and downs. And it's amazing how in the roller coaster of life, different people can seem to be having the exact same experience and yet experience it so differently. Isn't it? It's amazing. Uh, You can be side by side and experiencing two very different things. And one person uh, can be gripped with fear and anxiety, worry, or depression. And others are experiencing virtually the same thing, and it looks like they're having a great time. And life is just, ah, life's great. And if you've ever struggled with anxiety or with depression, it can be easy to look around at people who seem to be enjoying themselves, and you start to wonder, what's wrong with me? Why, why am I not experiencing the same thing? Why can't I just be enjoying life the same way that they are? One of the most classic children's tales is a, uh, is a story about the little engine who could. We, you've probably heard this story when you were a kid, or maybe you've even shared it with your kids. And it's amazing because it's this little engine, and he's trying to get up the hill, and he, and, and he can't quite make it. He's, he's working at it, he's working at it, and so what does he do? He gives himself little shots of self-esteem through a little affirmation, right? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And and he makes his way finally up the hill and he gets over the hill and he says, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could. Great lesson for kids about not giving up. But as adults, here's what we know. Life isn't as simple as just saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. In fact, I think most of us would probably identify more with this nursery rhyme. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle. The cow jumped over the moon. She asphyxiated long before reaching the moon and burned up on re-entry. No one has explained how the cow was able to generate enough lift to escape the pull of Earth's gravity or what she was seeking at that altitude. We tend to take a little bit more realistic approach to life, don't we? And here's the truth. Nobody told me, nobody told me that... Anxiety and depression are real. Nobody told me anxiety and depression are real. It's not something that gets talked about a lot. And today we're talking about anxiety and depression. I want to let you know a few things right up front. First, I know this is a sensitive topic for some. And uh, we're all coming at this from different perspectives and we're viewing this through a different lens. And let me just assure you, our main goal today is to encourage you. The goal today is not to shame anybody. There's not going to be any uh, guilting today. The goal is simply to point you towards hope. I want you to leave here with some hope. Secondly, I want to say this. I want you to know what the scriptures teach about this topic. That the, the scriptures are actually not silent about this topic. And third, let me make this disclaimer, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a counselor, but I am a human being who has been through seasons of anxiety and depression, and I've experienced the the same things that other people experience. I'm also a pastor who's walked through seasons with many different people. And so today we want to tackle this, and anxiety and depression affect so many people in our world today, young and old. And if you've ever found yourself dealing with these, then I want you to know that you're not alone, and I want you to know that there's hope. I want you to know it isn't something that you have to just deal with on your own. And what's unfortunate is that mental health issues oftentimes uh, get stigmatized, not only in society, but also in the church. And it's... It's not something that uh, we want to do. We want to make sure that we create an environment here where you can come as you are and deal with the things that you're really dealing with. Now, there's a book called Anxiety Free by Dr. Robert Lee. He says the average teenager today uh, exhibits the same level of of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient did in the 1950s. That's incredible. That kind of tells you where our level of anxiety is at as a society, as a culture. And uh, I read that this last week in, um, in America, our level of anxiety has increased every year for the last 80 years. Think about that. 80 years in a row, our anxiety keeps going up. That's a problem, right? And, and we've been through, in the last 80 years, a couple of world wars. Uh, we've had a lot of unrest. We've experienced a ton of political unrest in the last 30 years. Uh, we experienced 9-11 and all that that brought with it. And, and then we went through the uh, recession of 2007, 2008. And that caused us to become even more aware of how fragile our economy is. And then uh, you look at the last year. Just in the last year, we've been through like 20 years worth of anxiety, Right? I mean, everything that's gone on in the last year between uh, this pandemic and uh, racial tensions and political tensions and so many divisions that tend to spring up everywhere now. 
And it's unbelievable. It's no wonder uh, that our mental health can be frayed. And maybe you're like, man, I wasn't struggling with anxiety until I got here. Thanks. And if you want to know if you struggle with anxiety, I just want you to know, here's a few of the physical symptoms that, that kind of point to, I might be struggling a little bit with anxiety. Headaches, muscle pain, tension, sleep disturbances, breathing difficulties, chest pains, concentration problems, digestive issues, insomnia, low energy, forgetfulness, blood pressure, circulation problems, hormone imbalance, hypertension, migraines, weight gain, weight loss, body odor, hair loss, ringing in the ears, excessive sweating, shaking, trembling, cold chills, hot flashes, accelerated heart rate, numbness, tingling, upset stomach, nausea, shortness of breath, and dizziness. That's it. So if you experience any of those, you might have some anxiety. And anxiety is a problem, right? It's like, um, it's like a virus that runs in the background on your computer, and you don't really know that it's there, but it's just slowing everything down. It's like clogging up your computer. And uh, anxiety is like, a, it's like a virus in the background of our mainframe, and it just it slows us down. It clogs things up. It, it keeps us from thinking clearly. It keeps us from concentrating on things that we want to focus on. It keeps us from uh, engaging in relationships the way that we want to engage. And if you have struggled with anxiety or depression, I, I, want, I want you to hear me really, really clearly. It is not a sin to experience those things. It's not. And if you've ever had another pastor or a group leader say something to you like, man, you just need to have more faith or you just need to pray harder. Or maybe you've even heard this. You're, you're experiencing that because there's some kind of unconfessed sin in your life. I just want you to know nothing could be further from the truth. That is, that is they were dead wrong. And you would never think less of someone with a broken leg. You, you wouldn't. You would never tell them, man, you just need to pray more. And then your broken leg will heal better, right? Or you just need to have more faith. Or you have some unconfessed sin. That's why you broke your leg, right? What would you do for a broken leg? You would work toward healing. And here's what you need to know about healing. Healing is a process. Healing is a process. God will heal your broken leg through a process. And first you got to go have a doctor reset the bone. That's going to suck. And then they're probably going to put you in a cast, and that's going to be uncomfortable and inconvenient. And then you might have to go to physical therapy. You might be on crutches. You might have to wear a boot. Or, and there's all kinds of things, but it is a process. And why do we think it would be any different when it comes to our mental health? And so I want to take a few minutes today, and I want to look at a story from the Scriptures where God actually meets someone in the midst of his fear and his anxiety and his depression. And he meets him right there. And it's about a man named Elijah. And we're going to read this story in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. But to understand what's going on in 1 Kings 19, we first have to know what's going on in 1 Kings chapter 18. In chapter 18, Elijah, has, uh, there's a, a, there's a f um, drought in the land for the last three and a half years. It hasn't rained. And so they're, they're uh, experiencing not only drought, but famine because their crops aren't growing. And so there's a shortage of food and people are experiencing all kinds of hunger and poverty as a result. And yet the nation of Israel, who is supposed to follow God, the, the Yahweh, the Hebrew God, uh, they have turned their backs on God. They're following another God called Baal. And it's a pagan God. It's the pagan God of thunder and lightning, actually. And they're following this God. And in chapter 18, Elijah uh, challenges the prophets of Baal to a, a duel of sorts. And I'd encourage you to read both of these chapters, 1 Kings 18 and 19 this week on your own. But basically, he challenges them to say, we're going to set up an altar and we're going we're gonna to put a sacrifice on the altar. And then we're just going to pray and ask our God to light the altar on fire. And if your God, the God of lightning, can do it, then your God's the real God. And if my God can do it, my God's the real God. And long story short, 450 prophets of Baal are crying out for hours and hours and hours and asking their god Baal to light their sacrifice with fire. And yet, what happens is nothing. Uh, nothing happens. And, and actually, Elijah kind of starts to mock them a little bit. He's like, well, where's Baal? Maybe he's, maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he went to the restroom. I mean, it's fascinating. He's, he's, this is like, he's trash-talking them. This is Old Testament trash talk. You have to read this, 1 Kings 18 and 19. And finally, he actually brings out 12 pails of water, big jars of water, and dumps it on his sacrifice so that his altar and actually a trench around his altar is covered in water. 
And then he prays to God. And he says, God, show Israel that you are the one true God. And God, fire from heaven and lights it. It's this incredible story. And so Elijah is on this, this high. It's like, man, he just won this huge victory. And then he goes back to the palace and Jezebel, the queen, actually says this. She's so enraged by this that she says, uh, I will, may, may I die, may I not draw another breath until you're dead. Puts a bounty on Elijah's head. So he flees, he runs away, and then he prays to God to end the drought, and God ends the drought and it starts to rain. I mean, this is absolutely incredible. Elijah prays for God to light the, the altar with fire. It happens. He prays for the drought to end, and it starts to rain after three and a half years. And then we get into chapter 19, and he realizes there's a bounty on his head. And here's where we pick up the story. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. And then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day, and he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said, which is, I, I think I said the same thing this morning when I looked out the window. I have had enough, Lord. <laughs> no more snow. But Elijah says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Now think about this. We have every indication that all of this happened in one day. That in, in the morning, Elijah is uh, defeating the prophets of Baal in this incredible duel. He has the highest of highs. He, he prays to God and there's an end to a three and a half year drought. And at the end of the day, he is alone and begging God to let him die. Can anybody relate to that? Anybody feel like that? Like, like, doesn't it feel like when anxiety, when depression hits you, it kind of comes out of nowhere and you can be experiencing the highest of highs and the lowest of lows in a matter of moments. Sometimes it's the same day or the same week and it's like, man, you have the highest of highs and then you have the lowest of lows. And as we look at this story, I think there's a few things that we can draw out of this story that tend to bring anxiety or depression for us. And the first two aren't from the story directly, but I think they're important to acknowledge. The first one is this, trauma. For some of us, it's trauma. It's, it's something that happened that we never dealt with, something we experienced in our childhood, something we experienced in the past, and we never dealt with it, and it's there beneath the surface. And every once in a while, something reminds us, even subconsciously, of something that's undealt with. And these things can bring anxiety and depression into our lives. And I want to encourage you, that's nothing to be ashamed of or to try to hide. You need to get help for those things. Here's another one, biochemical. That this is just very, very real. Sometimes something can shift in our brain, in our body, the biochemical balance in our body. And we need to get help. We need someone to help us get things in our mind and our body back into balance. Here are some things that we see directly from Elijah's story. The unknown. Just not knowing what's going to happen. Elijah didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. He didn't know if he was going to be alive. He didn't know if he was going to survive the day. That can cause a lot of fear and anxiety and depression. Here's another one, the unlikely. Our imaginations can run wild. And often what happens is our imaginations run to the worst possible scenario. The least likely thing that could possibly happen, but it's like, it's like uh, I have an intense fear of flying because uh, I know that if I get on that airplane, probably mine's going to be the one that's going to go down. It's like that's really unlikely because millions of people fly all the time and, you know, it's, it's probably safer than driving in a car. But that's where we go, right? There's, there's an anxiety that comes from that because we think the unlikely. And this is exactly where Elijah finds himself. And some people live with extreme anxiety because they fear the worst case scenario and it paralyzes them from experiencing life. Another one is the uncontrollable. Things that are out of our control. He had no control over what the queen was going to do and, and her putting a bounty out on him and it was totally out of his control. 
For some of us, when things feel out of control, that can lead to some intense anxiety and depression. Here's another one, the unnecessary comparisons. Did you catch Elijah's prayer? Lord, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. I'm no better than my ancestors. Now, that simply wasn't true. He was a lot better off than his ancestors. And so often we do the same things. We tell ourselves how awesome everybody else's life is and how terrible ours is. And we let that be the story. We'll look at their life and look at their life and we let that become the story. But we don't know what everyone else struggles with. We don't always know the things that they're dealing with and the challenges that they've overcome in their life as well. Number seven, here's another one, isolation. Not only did Elijah feel isolated in his leadership role as a prophet, and anybody who has led anything knows that there is sometimes a real loneliness and a weight that comes with leadership. But not only that, he went into the wilderness alone. It says he left his servant and he traveled into the wilderness alone. And so now he's dealing with not only the, this, these emotions of anxiety and depression, but he has isolation on top of that. And finally, false narratives or toxic stories. False narratives, toxic stories. This is what psychologists call rumination. Rumination means we're just repeating lies to ourselves over and over and over again. We say, well, this is how it is. This is how it's going to be. This is my life now. And we ruminate on that. And we let that sit there. And we just keep telling ourselves and telling ourselves and telling ourselves. And the truth the truth for many of us is that nobody has lied to us more than we've lied to ourselves. Because we feed ourselves these toxic stories and we let that just ruminate inside. And these negative playlists are on repeat. We're not good enough. God doesn't love us. This will never get any better. There isn't any hope. But the truth is, those are simply lies. Those are not true. You feel those things, but feelings are not the same thing as reality. And God won't leave you there. And he didn't leave Elijah there either. We pick it up in verse 5. And it says he fell asleep under the broom tree. But then it says this, as he was sleeping, an angel touched him. Get up and eat. And it touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. I mean, sometimes you just need a donut and a nap. <laughs> and then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. Now, it's easy to miss this, but we can see right here that God was not just tending to Elijah's emotional condition or spiritual condition. He's actually tending to his physical condition. He's actually helping him. Elijah is exhausted and overwhelmed. And the angel said, you need some rest and you need some food and you can't keep going like this. This is about self-care. And sometimes we need some self-care to help us get through seasons of anxiety or depression. Did you know that studies say that exercising four times a week for 20 minutes has the same effect as anti-depression medication on your brain? That's called self-care. And for some of us, we need to spend some time on self-care. God leads Elijah in some important self-care. And then he leads him to another place in the, in the wilderness. And Elijah travels again, and he goes in the wilderness, and he meets with God. And in verse 13, it says, A voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? God speaks to Elijah. Elijah, what are you doing here? And this is the second time God had asked him the same question. And when God asks questions in Scripture, like, What are you doing here? It's not because God's looking for information. Like, I don't, like what are you doing here? No, it's, it's because God wants Elijah to ask this question of himself. He wants him to do a little bit of self-probing, and he wants Elijah to ask this, to look within, to see the truth that God is trying to speak to him. But Elijah is still ruminating. He's still ruminating all these negative thoughts and all these, all these toxic stories and, and false comparisons, and he's telling himself this, and here's his reply. He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. 
But God wouldn't let Elijah stay there in his depression and in his darkness. God speaks to him. And God gives him a new assignment. And God says, look, Elijah, I'm not done with you. I'm not done with you. You have another mission to fulfill. This is not the end. I still have a mission for you. Your life is not over. And then God ends with this in verse 18. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. By the way, Elijah, you are not the only one. I know it feels that way, but I'm telling you, there are still 7,000 people who have not bowed down. There are still 7,000 people who have not turned their back on me. You are not alone. They have not forsaken me. They have not bowed down to Baal. God brings loving truth to Elijah in the midst of his despair. And that's what God wants to do with you and me. In the midst of when we feel the lowest, in the midst when we feel anxiety, in our darkness, in our despair, in our depression, God wants to speak and lovingly bring truth in the midst of that season. Now with that in mind, let me get really practical. How do we deal with this when we're in this season? What can we do to practice some self-care? What can we do to partner with God as He speaks truth into our lives? Well, number one, don't allow pride to keep you weighed down. Well, what do you mean by that? There is this connection that we often miss. There's this connection between, uh, between pride and anxiety and humility and anxiety. And the Apostle Peter writes about this connection in his letter to followers of Jesus in the first century. And here's what he says. He says, All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Okay, well, what does humility have to do with anxiety? How are those two things connected? Well, basically, pride says, I got this. I can handle this. This isn't too much for me. And pride actually drives us to isolation because it makes us feel like we can handle everything on our own. But the reality is, humility says, I need help. I don't got this. I can't handle this on my own. I, pride says, I, I don't, I don't want to admit that it's a burden that I'm carrying. My pride is keeping me from admitting that it's too heavy. And I'm trying to control things that I can't control. And my fear of what could happen in the future is causing me so much anxiety that it's actually shutting down my life. So Peter continues. He says, humble yourselves, therefore. Humble yourselves. In light of that, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Again, this is what makes Christianity, this is what makes following Jesus so different from any other world religion. In every religion, it's, it's here's the things that you need to do, X, Y, Z. Here's the things that you have to do in order to somehow experience healing. It's all about you achieving or acquiring or, or doing the right things. And Peter says, no, you can actually just transfer your anxiety to him. You can actually just give it to him. You can, you can transfer that over to Jesus because he actually really cares about you. And he wants to take that from you. It's not anything you have to do. You can actually give him, cast that anxiety on him because he cares for you. And when you humble yourself and you give that anxiety to God, you feel lighter. He lifts you up in due time. This is the part we don't like. In due time. So part of the reason we struggle with this is because we want to be the ones to determine in due time. In due time should be right away. But we don't get to be the ones to determine in due time. We are the same people who burn our mouths on Hot Pockets. There's an impatience in us, right? And so we don't determine due time. Due time might be the end of the week or the end of the month or the end of the year or next year. God decides due time. But the promise is that when we take our anxiety and we constantly give it to him, and we constantly transfer it to him, that God will lift us up in due time, that God will make us lighter. Why? Because he cares about you. And maybe you think, well, what has God ever done to show me that he cares about me? He sent Jesus into this world. That Jesus came into this world to show us what God's love is like. And in the ultimate expression of God's love, he allowed himself to be put to death on the cross. He carried your sin on him. He took the burden of your sin and my sin on himself on the cross. 
And he said, that anxiety that you're carrying, that depression that you're carrying, the things that you're carrying, all the stuff that is weighing you down, give it to me. Let me take it on me. You can transfer that to me. All of you who are weary, all of you who carry heavy burdens, give that to me. Take my yoke upon you. It's light. This burden is light. You're going to find rest for your souls. Give that to me. And that is, it's so critical for us to understand. That's how much God loves us. You can cast your anxiety, Peter says, on him because he really cares about you. Okay, well, that's great. Cast your anxiety. That's a great answer. Okay, how do I do that? How do I cast my anxiety upon him? How do I transfer my anxiety over? I mean, I'd love to do that, but what does that look like? The Apostle Paul addresses this a little bit more directly, and he writes this. Give your anxiety to God through prayer. Okay, great. I fully understand the pushback to this, right? You're like, okay, Paul, that's your, that is your JV answer to my varsity question. Like, prayer, oh, that's the church answer, right? But before you write that off as being overly simplistic, listen to what the Apostle Paul writes to followers of Jesus living in Philippi. And as you read this, I want you to remember, he's writing this from prison, And if anybody had the right to experience anxiety, it's a guy writing from prison. If anybody had depression, it's a guy writing from prison. And yet he's writing to them to deal with their anxiety and depression. And here's what he writes. Don't worry about anything. Instead, this is how you transfer it. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then... And then is an important word. Then means once you do the first thing, the second thing happens. When you clean your room, then you can have a cookie. The cookie doesn't happen without the clean room. The first thing happens, and then the second thing happens. When you finish your homework, then you can go out with your friends. Then is the byproduct. When this happens, then this can happen, but it only happens in this order. And so Paul says, tell God what you need. Thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Paul says, instead of spending your energy carrying an anxiety about something that you can't even control, instead of carrying that around with you, something you were never meant to carry, spend your energy Telling God what you need. Be honest with God about what you're feeling. Be honest with God about this anxiety, about the depression, about the things that are out of your control. God can handle that. Be honest with God. Tell Him and then begin to thank Him for the things that He's already done for you. And here's why. When you do that, Paul says, I can't explain it to you. Uh, In fact, it's beyond our ability to understand, but something shifts in your heart and in your mind when you start to express gratitude for what God has done. Gratitude shifts your perspective on things and you will begin to experience peace. And he says, it's the kind of peace that guards your heart. It's the kind of peace that guards your mind and your situation may be exactly the same. Nothing will have changed in your circumstances, but everything will have changed inside of you because suddenly God's peace will guard your heart and guard your mind. And Paul says when you face fears and when you face worries and when you face anxieties, God doesn't just remove you from the situation. He has the strength. He gives you the strength and the peace to, miss, to go through the midst of that situation. And so Jesus says, God loves you. Why do you fear Why do you worry when God loves you so much? And Peter says, because God loves you and cares about you, you can cast your anxiety on him. He'll take that from you, but you're going to have to fight pride to do that. You're going to have to humble yourself and admit you need help. And Paul says, the way that you do that is through prayer. You tell God exactly what you need, and you thank him for what he's done, and you will experience the kind of peace that you cannot understand. And that's the pushback, right? But I don't understand it. That doesn't make sense. Paul goes, I I know. Exactly. Exactly. But there's just something that happens when you take the things that you're worried about, your, your anxiety and those things, and you, and you cast that onto him. And then you begin to just express gratitude. And it's like reverse rumination. Instead of, instead of ruminating on the toxic stories and the negative stories and the false comparisons and these narratives that play out in our mind, it's like you ruminate on all that God has done for you. 
You ruminate on the things and you remember, you know what? I went through this several years ago and God, you came through. And, and you've been faithful and you show up and you never leave me and you never forsake me. And you ruminate on that. And, and Paul says, it's like nothing changes out here, but something changes in here. And he says, I can't understand it. It's a kind of peace that I can't understand, that I can't even fully explain. It's just that he guards your heart and your mind. Now, let me give you some final thoughts as we close today. First, you are not alone. God reminded Elijah that he was not alone, and I want you to know you're not alone either. And can I tell you something? That's why we do groups. That's why we do groups. The whole goal of that is so that you build a community of people around you who know your name, who love you, who see you for exactly who you are, and, and who love you exactly as you are. And as we grow as a church, you need a group of people who know your name and can help support you and remind you that you are known and that you are loved. That is why we do groups. So I want to encourage you, if you're not in a group, you got to get in a group. It's so important for you to build relationships with people who are moving in the same direction as you spiritually. Because when the proverbial fertilizer hits the fan, you need people. You can't reverse engineer. You can't go back and try to build community once you're in the midst of a season where you need people. You can't retroactively build community. So you start building community now. You need to know you're not alone. Secondly, get many kinds of help. If you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with depression, can I tell you something? There is no silver bullet. There's no one easy fix. There's no one quick fix. There will likely won't be one specific thing that gets you out of that season. And so we all need good friends. We all need spiritual uh, guidance. We all need uh, community. We all need counseling. We all need self-care. Get all the help you can get. Don't try to find it in one area. Get all the help you can get. Get many kinds of help. Uh, third, it takes time. Remember, you probably didn't arrive in this season overnight. You probably won't go out of this season overnight. It's going to take time, just like a broken leg. But commit to the process of healing and lean in, and God won't leave you alone. And finally, you need to know this. If you're experiencing a season of anxiety, depression, you need to know it's a chapter and not a conclusion. It's a chapter and not a conclusion. And in our pain and in our struggles, we are so tempted to say, well, this is it. This is the story. This is the way it's always going to be. This is how my life is. This is where my story ends. There's no hope. But can I tell you something? Never put a period where God puts a comma. There's more to your story. And God is not done writing your story. And this chapter might be a difficult one, but it doesn't have to be the end of the story. In fact, we believe that at the end of the story, God is going to fully do away with these things that cause us harm. Anxiety and worry and depression and despair and discouragement. That one day, God is going to fully renew and fully restore not only this world, but every single one of us. And one day, all things will be as they should be. That is hopeful. And until then, you're invited to put your trust in God. You're invited to pray to him, to tell him the things you're experiencing, and to thank him for what he's done, and to experience the kind of peace that goes beyond our ability to understand. And if you've never said yes to the invitation to transfer your anxiety to him and to say, you know what, God, I want to follow you. I want to be a part of your family. I, I want to say yes to that. When Jesus came into the world, he, he showed us what God's love is like. And the ultimate expression of love, he allowed himself to be put to death. His body was laid in a tomb. And according to multiple eyewitness accounts, he rose from the dead. And folks, that means death is not the end. There is more to this life than this life. And you and I have been invited by the God of the universe into his family to live forever, to, to live with hope. And if you've never said yes to that invitation, it isn't based on you behaving your way in. It's based on who God is and the invitation that's already been extended to you. If you've never said yes to that, I want to extend that invitation this morning. Whether you're here, whether you're watching online, you can say yes by just agreeing with this prayer as we close. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times where I've walked away from you. And I thank you that you never walk away from me. You never leave me alone. 
Even in my seasons of despair and depression and anxiety, I know you're with me. I believe that you're with me. So adopt me into your family. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. And help me to trust you. Help me to follow you. To build my life around your way of living as best as I know how from this moment on. And God, I pray for every one of us today. Because every one of us goes through seasons where we experience anxiety, discouragement, despair, depression. And I pray that in the midst of those seasons, we would transfer our care to you, trusting that you care for us. And that we would experience a peace that we can't even understand. Guard our hearts and guard our minds as we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a great talk. I needed that today. So here's how we're going to close today. In just a moment, we'll have an opportunity as part of our worship to bring back a percentage that God has entrusted to us financially. So if you would like to do that today, you can use your giving envelope. You can also use the Church Center app to give. So as you prepare for that, I just want to go over your connection card. And if you just prayed that prayer and accepted Jesus, we want to celebrate that with you. And if you share your information with us, we would like to follow up with you, answer any questions you might have, get you a Bible in your hands. In fact, they are free right on our desk in our lobby area. So you can grab one of those. And if you have a prayer request you'd like to leave with us, our team would love to pray over that with you today and this week. So you can fill that out as well. And what Jeremiah talked about with next steps as well, one of our next steps is our first step, right? We always have to have our first step too. And on March 7th, if you would like to know more about Westbridge and how we got started, know how you can even partner with us, would you write that on your card, first step, and we want to get you registered for that. We'd like to register. In the past, we've kind of let you just show up. If you're here, show up. But we want to be more prepared for you. So if you, we can provide childcare, we will have food ready to go. And we just love meeting you and sharing what Westbridge is all about. So this is the last week to this series, and our next series starts next Sunday, and it's called Irresistible, and it's going to go all the way until Easter, and it's going to be an awesome series. So if you have a friend, a coworker, anyone that you would like to invite to this series, it'll start next Sunday, and I encourage you to do that. So anything that you're not taking with you today, you can just drop in the giving stations at the back of the auditorium. And I'm so glad you made it here today. Drive safe and enjoy the rest of your week.